Hello, everybody. Welcome to Cornelia Church. Welcome to our online service. If this is your first time tuning in, we want to welcome you to join us in our worship service. You can fill in a connect card that we have for you. Um, you can find that at the end of the service today to get to know us a little bit more and to connect with us. Our pastors, we get to love to get to know you. So you can fill that in and we can connect with each other in that way. Today we begin a brand new sermon series. I'm so excited for this because we're going to go through the book of Ephesians and this sermon series is called Alive in Christ. I'm also very excited about this because we have invited a guest speaker, a dear friend of us, a guest speaker. He is Pastor Craig and he is an associate pastor from Tense Church. This is not the first time he has visited us and, and taught us uh, from the Bible. We've a couple of times before in Richmond High, Richmond Secondary School, he has come and he has given us some teaching as well. So today I'm so excited that we go through the whole sermon series with him um, through the book of Ephesians. So I invite you, if you don't usually do this, bring your notebook, bring your Bible, and make sure you write down anything that God speaks to you through Him today. So before I begin our worship today, uh, I want to set us up in this way. I'm going to read to you a passage from Ephesians um, to set us up to worship, and then uh, we'll enter into worship. The passage I want to start with today is from chapter 1, verse 3 to 5. It goes like this. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of His will, to the praise of His glorious grace, with which He has blessed us in the Beloved. It's in love that God has chosen us and predestined us for adoptions as sons and daughters of, Jesus, uh, of, of Him through Jesus Christ. So this is what we're going to sing about today. We're going to sing about His love. We're going to worship. For, we thank Him for the great love that He has loved us. So I'm going to invite you now to stand. Let us pray together, and then we'll enter into worship. God, we thank You for the love that You have for us. In some ways, I don't think we can ever fully comprehend the, the depth and the length and the height and the breadth of the love that you have for us. But God, today, as we enter into worship, we pray that you'll help us to understand a bit more, to feel a bit more, comprehend a bit more of who you are and what is that great love you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See 
sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever.
And you stand before me I know you love me I know you love me Can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died He for me, who caused His pain for me, who Him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be That Thou, my God, should die for me? Amazing love, how can it be That Thou, my God, should die for me? He left His Father Father's throne above, so free, so infinite is grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free. God, it found out me. Tis mercy all immense and free. For oh my God, it found out me. Long my imprints in spirit lay, fast bound in sin. And nature's night Thine eye diffused A quickening ray I woke the dungeon Flamed with light My chains fell off My heart was free I rose, went forth And followed Thee Chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. No condemnation now I tread, Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him. Divine, hold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Hold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ. What amazing love this is. That Christ would die for us when we were still sinners. What amazing love this is that through Christ we are adopted as sons and daughters of the God Most High. God, we pray for this church. We pray for our brothers and sisters that through the sermon series, we can gain in knowledge and in strength to comprehend what is that great love that you have for us. 
And God, I don't think we can ever fully, fully comprehend it. Even if we were to use all our lives, God, we pray that we can grow in it, grow in love for you, and grow in knowledge of the love that you have for us. Would you open our minds and open our hearts and open our ears to receive the word that you have for us? In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Hi, my name is Craig. I'm a pastor at Tenth Church in Vancouver. I'm also a friend of Wilbur and Koinonia Church, and I've been invited as a guest speaker over these next four weeks to come and to preach to you. And it's my great pleasure to be here with you today. Jeremy Bentham is a well-known modern philosopher. He's known as the father of modern utilitarianism. A few years ago, it caused quite a stir when the newspapers based out of London found out that Jeremy Bentham had attended a council meeting at the University College of London. Now, normally you would think, who cares if a philosopher and a teacher attends a council meeting at a college? Well, the thing is that Jeremy, by this point, had been dead for over 100 years. And this caused a lot of interest. What would cause a hundred-year-old dead philosopher to show up at a council meeting? Well, as we found out, before Jeremy Bentham died, he left some stipulations in his will. He said that he didn't want to be buried or cremated, but instead he wanted his body to be preserved and a waxed head to be placed on his preserved body. And usually this body, rests in the museum at the University College of London. But every now and again, the staff take Jeremy's body out and put it in the council for other people to see. And this one particular time when they put him in the council, many of the council members didn't even know until many minutes into their meeting when they were shocked to see Jeremy Bentham's preserved body sitting right next to them. Well, as the newspapers noted, Jeremy Bentham was there, and while the council was making many important decisions and talking about important decisions for the college that day, that he was noted as being present, but not voting. Sometimes in our spiritual lives, we too can be a little bit like Dr. Bentham. We can be present, but not voting. That we can be there, but not alive and flourishing in our lives. And many of us feel this because we feel the longing for more, that we want to be, in Paul's own words, to come to life. Well, over the next four weeks, we're going to be listening to Paul preach to us through his letter to the Ephesians. And Paul, in the letter to Ephesians, is talking about God's cosmic vision for the world, for the church, and for each and every one of us. But over the next four weeks, we're going to zoom in from this cosmic vision to focus in on God's vision for our lives. Or in Paul's own words, what it means and looks like and feels like to become alive in Christ. So let me invite you to turn with me to the very beginning of Paul's letter that we call Ephesians. And we're going to read the first 11 verses together. This is Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. 
In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of his grace, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. The letter that I just read from, which we call Ephesians, is an ancient letter around 2,000 years old. And it's a letter that Paul wrote when he was in house prison. When Paul was living in, in Ephesus, he was falsely accused by many of the leaders there. And he was arrested by Roman officials and taken to Rome, where he was put under house arrest and lived there for two years. While living in house arrest, Paul wrote many letters, one of which was the one right here, Paul's letter that we call Ephesians. And Paul, for those two years, was unable to leave the house. He was in social isolation, we may call it, having lost his freedom to leave, having lost his ability to visit his community, although people surely visited him. And Paul also lost the meaningful work for which he had been called the work as a missionary to plant churches. I think if there is ever a time when we could relate to how Paul may naturally be feeling in this circumstance, it's now, during our own social situation where many of us are in isolation, when many people too have lost the meaningful work for which they have felt called. Paul's letter that we call Ephesians is also quite unique among many of the letters that Paul has written. Whereas many of Paul's letters are letters written to particular churches or to a particular person, dealing with a very narrow scope, maybe talking about a conflict in a church or giving advice or guidance, and interwoven with that, maybe preaching or offering um, a vision or a window into who Jesus is. But in general, the scope is rather narrow as he's talking to one person or one church community. In contrast, however, theologians say that Ephesians is not a letter just to one church, but instead it's what they call a circular letter, a letter that likely Paul had intended to be circulated not just to the church in Ephesus, but to a number of churches in the surrounding area. And as such, Paul's vision for this letter isn't as narrow as many of the other ones. Instead, he seems to deal with this cosmic vision, with God's cosmic vision. God's cosmic vision for the universe, God's cosmic vision for the church, and God's cosmic vision for us. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to narrow in on, in the next four weeks we don't have the time or the space to deal with God's cosmic vision for the universe or for the church. Instead, we're going to pay close attention to Paul's vision or God's vision in the words of Paul for each and every one of our lives. I think if you could subtitle Paul's letter to the Ephesians or which we call Ephesians, I think it would be right to call it alive in Christ. That these are in fact Paul's very words from chapter 3 alive in Christ. What does it mean to look, to feel, to become alive in Christ? Or as some modern philosophers have called it, to become truly human, to flourish as human beings in the world. If you want to take a master's class on what it means to come alive in Christ and to live as truly human, then I invite you with me to dwell deeply in Paul's letter called Ephesus, which we'll be doing together for the next four weeks. And we're going to begin this week with really where Paul begins. We're going to look first at who is God, and then second, who are we? So first, who is God? The writer and pastor A.W. Tozer says, 
What comes to mind when we think of God is the most important thing about us. What comes to our minds when we think of God is the most important thing about us. So, what comes to your mind when you think about God? I'm familiar with a woman, I, I know her personally, who shared with me that when she was younger, when she thought of God, she thought of her own father. That when she thought of her heavenly father, God, she thought of her earthly father who raised her. And she explained that her earthly father was cruel and could never be personally satisfied. That she was always felt like he was disappointed in her. And so when she thought of God, she thought of this father who was cruel and harsh and mean and who was never satisfied. And she thought that, too, God was cruel and harsh and that he, too, was never satisfied with what she did. And she grew up with a low self-esteem about herself. That she experienced the reality that what we think of God is the most important thing about us. That in the same way that the planets revolve around the mass of the sun, so too the idea of who God is within our mental architecture takes up so much weight, so much mass, that the other ideas of who are we, what is the purpose of the world, and how should we live revolve around this idea of who we think God is. What comes to mind when you think of God is the most important thing about you. And Paul wanted you to know two things about God. And the first one is that God is generous. He says in the passage that I read a little bit earlier, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. Do you hear that? Bless, bless, bless. That in the original language in the Greek, that for Paul, there's a deep connection between this Greek word for blessing and the Hebrew word, which was barak. And barak means to, to literally a physical posture to kneel in a state of giving a gift to someone. If you were to approach a king with a gift, maybe an offering, you would go up with, to them on your knees and you would bend down and offer them this gift that you have for them. And it wouldn't have been surprising for Paul's audience to hear that Paul is seeking with his words and his life to bless, to give a gift to God. But what would have been surprising in this ancient world, where for Paul writing to people in Ephesus and the area surrounding called Asia Minor, it would have been surprising that God would bless that he would give gifts to people, that he would be one who is generous. That for people growing up in Ephesus, many of them having not grown up knowing the God of Israel, that for them, they grew up with the stories of the Greek and Roman gods who were cruel and capricious. They were not generous like the God of Israel. Instead, as they would have grown up reading in their religious stories, in their own Genesis narratives, in their own stories, that the gods created humans to live and to work as servants strictly for their own greedy benefit. And yet when we open up our own scriptures, and we turn to the first few pages, we see a very different story. We see a God who didn't create humans out of a desire to create slaves or for the, his own greedy benefit. But there was so much life and generosity and love within God himself that creation is an extension, a gift of that which is already within God himself. The God is one who seeks to give good gifts to the whole universe and to people that he placed his own image on humanity. And when he created us, he called us very good. That God is one who longs to give good gifts to humanity. And as we experience the blessing of God, the gift of God, we in turn are shaped by that blessing and long to bless others. 
In the history of the church, many people have been shaped and transformed by the generosity of God. None of them perhaps more famous than St. Patrick. St. Patrick, as you may know, is the person behind whom St. Patrick's Day was named. I'm not sure how he would feel about St. Patrick's Day and, and what goes on it today. But he was a missionary living in the fifth century. And when Patrick was a young boy, he was captured by pirates and taken to live in Ireland, where he lived as a slave and worked as a shepherd. And it was there living in Ireland as a slave and as a shepherd, being given no food and very little, little clothing, that he began to know the generous nature of God more deeply. That even though he was out alone in the fields by himself, with again no food and very little clothing, in the cold, wet winters of Ireland, he began to know the generous voice and presence of God in his life. One day, he heard what he calls a messenger of God call out to him, saying, Patrick, if you go down to the nearby shipyard, to the nearby harbor, there will be a ship who will take you away. And this has been really risky for Patrick to leave because if he was caught or if they didn't take him, he would likely be killed. But Patrick, trusting this generous voice, traveled down to the harbor and spoke with the captain. And after speaking with the captain, the captain refused entry aboard the ship. I imagine Patrick feeling confused and fearful. But a few minutes later, looking up to the ship, he heard a call from one of the shipmates who called down to him and said, the captain has changed his mind, come aboard. And eventually Patrick made his way back home where he would begin to get more involved with the church there and continue to experience the generosity of God. Now, I don't know about you, but if I managed to escape slavery and the harsh conditions that Patrick was in, I would never want to leave. And yet, as Patrick continued to experience the generosity of God, he began to feel the desire to be generous to the people who had been so cruel to him. He felt the call on his life to become a missionary to the people of Ireland. And so, before he left, he gathered a group of people to join him. And then he asked the church to give an audacious financial gift, an incredible amount of money in this time and age. And surprisingly, they said yes. And they loaded these people and these finances onto the boat and Patrick traveled to Ireland. And when he got there, he met with each of the tribes there, including the one who had captured him and who had enslaved him. And when he met with them, one of the first things that he did was he gave them an incredibly generous gift. He gave it as a way to say, just as we are being generous in this gift towards you, there is a God who longs to be even more generous in ways that are even more beautiful and beneficial to you. And Paul's missionary efforts in Ireland were so successful that shortly afterwards, Ireland would become one of the most Christianized places in the world, where there is a higher density of people following Jesus than anywhere else. That as people come to know the generosity of God, they are transformed in turn and long to be generous. That Paul wants us to know that God is generous. The second thing that Paul wants us to know is that God is in control. Paul says in verse four and five from the passage that I read earlier, that they were chosen before the foundations of the earth, and that they are predestined in love. That, Paul, that God is in control of everything that is going on. That nothing that happens surprise him, surprises him. As Paul says, they are predestined in love. Now, some of you may have a negative reaction to the word predestined, that maybe it carries certain connotations for you of not being able to choose and the lack of free will. 
feels perhaps quite rigid for you, especially if you grew up in a faith tradition that emphasized this aspect of theology. And yet for Paul, predestination isn't rigid or harsh or take in any way from our ability to engage in choice, to follow and love God and to accept him into our lives. But instead, Paul associates predestination with love. That if we put this back into Paul's ancient context, we can understand this a little bit better. That in Paul's ancient context, the Greek and Roman gods were those who were hardly in control of their own emotions, not to mention the universe. That they were known to bicker and to fight with one another, and they were completely untrustworthy for those who followed them. That one day you may be in their good books, you may feel like you are chosen by them, and the next minute they would turn themselves on you. And in contrast, Paul is saying that you can trust God that he is completely in control of everything that is going on, that nothing is out of his control. Even suffering is not outside of his control. When I was exploring Christianity when I was in my late teens, one of the questions that pervaded my mind was, can God be good in the midst of suffering? And as I pulled on the strings of this question, kind of like a ball of yarn, I realized that there was an even deeper question embedded within the question. And that is, is God in control in the midst of suffering? According to Paul, the answer is yes. As he says later in verses, verse 11, God works all things according to the counsel of his will. That nothing, even suffering, is outside of the scope of God's control. That doesn't mean that God is the source of sin, death, cruelty, or suffering, but that nothing is out of his control. The preacher and social revolutionary for justice, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Another way of saying this is the arc of history is long, but it bends towards the just will of God. The arc of history is long, but it bends towards the just will of God. That even in the midst of suffering, that nothing is outside of God's control. And the story that comes to mind that most epitomizes this is the story of Joseph from the Bible, from, from Genesis. And some of you may remember, or maybe you've never heard the story of Joseph. But Joseph, when he was a child, was sold by his brothers into slavery. And he eventually ended up serving as a slave in Egypt. A little while later, he ended up in prison under false accusation. And a number of years after landing himself in prison, Joseph was given the opportunity to interpret a dream from the Pharaoh of Egypt. And because he was able to correctly interpret this dream, Joseph is made the second most powerful person in all of Egypt, the effective prime minister of Egypt. Running the farms, the finances, he is in control essentially of everything within Egypt. It's quite the turn. A little while later, Joseph's brothers who were living in another part of the ancient world they traveled to Egypt due to a famine. And while they were there, Joseph discovers that his brothers were in the land. And eventually he reveals himself to his brothers and we find out that the brothers are understandably afraid. Having sold the second most powerful person in Egypt into slavery when he was a child. But Joseph, knowing that his brothers are afraid, turns to them and says this, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God intended it for good. God is generous, and the arc of history may be long, 
but is ultimately bent towards his good will. That God is even able to use suffering, and as we will find out in the story of Jesus, death to weave as a part of his good story and his good purposes. That Paul wants us to know that God is both generous and in control. The second thing that Paul wants us to know is that we are loved. So Paul wants us to know that who is God, that he is one who is generous and in control. The second thing he wants us to know is who are we? At the foundation of our character, of our identity, who is it that we are? And Paul, throughout the letter to the Ephesians, says a number of things about who we are, that we are beloved children, that we are adopted, that we are part of the body of Christ. But throughout the letter, there is this one core that is woven throughout it all, and that is that we are loved. I think no passage better in the letter epitomizes this than a passage in chapter 3. This may be the passage that actually epitomizes our character more deeply than any passage throughout Scripture. That Paul praying, offering a prayer to the God who is generous and in charge, prays this over us. He prays that we may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That what is it that Paul hopes that you would know for yourself? That you, like an explorer, would spend your life discovering about yourself? The height, the length, the depth, the width of? It's the love of Christ for you. What is the very foundation of your identity and character? It's the love of God. Something that can never be taken away and something that is freely given. This is how Paul, living in isolation, having so much taken away from him, is still able to speak with joy and to live a life of flourishing because he knows to the depths of his being that he is loved by God, that love shapes us. A study out of UCLA from 2013 shows that when children are young, when they receive the love and affection of their parents, that it has a profound impact on them, that they can actually register the impact in an MRI on their way their brains are formed. And it impacts them over the long term as well. The children who receive love and affection as a child often end up being mentally and physically healthier adults. And according to Paul, the love of God changes us as well, that we live spiritually healthier lives too. That the love of God can even shape us as adults and in the darkest of circumstances. A few months ago, I had the opportunity to meet a young man and to hear his story. And he shared a little bit with me, which he's given permission for me to share with you. And this is what he said to me. My initiation with depression, anxiety, and suicidal thoughts began when I was in high school. I initially had a hard time either recognizing what was wrong with me, let alone explaining it to others. In the early 90s, I don't recall mental health issues ever being discussed openly. The closest thing I ever came to ending my life was when I was in high school. I found myself weeping myself to sleep every night, begging God to end my misery. But it was in a moment of brutal honesty with God that he supernaturally wrapped me in his arms of love and gave me the hope that I needed to carry on. That in my conversation with him, he went on to explain that in that moment of darkness, that he had been calling out to God. And that in his darkest moment, that these are his own words, 
God had hit me with a lightning bolt of love, with this supernatural force of love that hit him like a lightning bolt. And that even in the darkness of this moment, wishing that his life would come to an end, that love was able to transform the experience of darkness and give him enough hope to make it through that dark and difficult situation and time in his life. That love transforms us. That when we come to know that love is the most important part about us, That the most important part about you is not your job, how much money you make, or who you know. The most important thing about you is that you are loved by God. You are loved by God. Pedro Arupe was a Jesuit priest living in Japan during the Second World War. When the Second World War broke out, he was taken into a concentration camp and placed in solitary confinement. And he lived in solitary confinement for many months. Later in the war, he was taken to a city outside of Hiroshima. And it was while living outside of Hiroshima that he witnessed one of the nuclear bombs go off, which turned the city of Hiroshima into a giant ball of flames. And he witnessed death and destruction to which the world at that point had never seen. And I would imagine that someone who had seen so much death and suffering in his life would become bitter and would become skeptical of the goodness of God and the love of God for him. And yet the more he experienced, the more Pedro began to believe the centrality of love. And I'll end this sermon by reading a poem written by Pedro himself. Nothing more is more practical than finding God. That is, than falling in love in a quite absolute final way. What you are in love with, what seizes your imagination, will affect everything. It will decide what will get you out of bed in the morning, What will you do with your evenings, how you spend your weekends, what you read, who you know, what breaks your heart, and what amazes you with joy and gratitude. Fall in love, stay in love, and it will decide everything. Amen. Church, at this time, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to enter into a time of response right now. But before we do that, I'm going to invite you to do one thing. Pastor Craig has taught us that we have a new identity now, that we are sons and daughters and that we are loved. We're loved by God. That's our identity. And, and I don't know whether in the past you have been taking on other identities false identities like you have been identifying yourself with maybe your ability at work or at school that for some reason if 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 you do better at these places that you are more loved you're more worthy or or maybe previously you have associated yourself with a relationship that you have and what these relationships think of you maybe your friends your family members your boyfriend and your girlfriend. And I wonder if any of us in here that we have been taking on that identity. It's like a, it's like a name tag that we've, we've hung around our neck and we're not willing to let it go. But today, Pastor Craig taught us that we don't have to hold on to that identity. That's a false one. Because our worth is, is not fluctuating because our worth is based on God's love for us. And that's our new identity, that we are sons and daughters and we're loved. So in this response song right now, I'm going to invite you to put off that old identity. Put off that name tags that you've been holding on to and take on a new name tag, would you? Take on this new name tag, new identity. And on that name tag is a son of the God Most High or daughter of the God Most High. 
And then it also reads in small letters, I am loved. I am loved. I'm going to invite you to put off that old name tag and put on this new identity. Thank you that you're the good father, that you've chosen us, 
to be your sons and daughters. God, help us to live out that new identity, that new name batch, that new name tag that we have from you. That we are sons and daughters and we are loved. And God, when, when there are people or when our thoughts or when even ourselves, we, we want to go back to that false identity, God, help us. Help us to not take those back onto ourselves. And may our lives always be rooted in your love that you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Now, as we bring our worship service to a close, I have a few announcements to share with you. The first thing is Oikos. Oikos is our small group ministry. Uh, and if you're not already in a small group, I want you to strongly consider joining one in, in the coming September. Small group is the place for us to grow relationship with one another, to grow in fellowship with one another, but also grow in relationship with God, to, to know Him more and more and to learn what it means to follow Him. So if you're not already in Oikos, just strongly think about this, pray about this. If you have questions about what Oikos is like, you know, you can talk to us, chat with us, um, leave a question in the comments or, or maybe go to the connect card that we mentioned and you can fill in a question there. And just a spe specific word I'll mention here, if you're in high school, or if you're in college, we have our cause and small group for you guys as well. So don't miss out. Don't miss out that fellowship with one another time during this period of your life. And this is the best time, best time to grow in relationship and friendship with one another and in God. So strongly consider this. If you have any questions, please let us know. You can find that registration form in our website, mykc.ca, and you can also find all the information you need um, on our website there as well. Second announcement that I have for you is if you have young children in your family, we have a Karpas worship content. Karpas is our children ministry. You can find worship content like songs, like Bible story, like devotion materials, or even uh, materials and resources for parents uh, on our YouTube channel and on our website as well. So I strongly encourage you to go check it out. Our, our children's uh, ministry staff, they've been putting a lot of effort and a lot of creativity in creating these content. And a lot of our uh, families from our church, they have given us a lot of positive feedback about how their kids have been watching these contents and engaging in worship and even watching uh, other other contents from other grades as well that's really not meant for their age but they just really they watch all of them because they are so excited and they love the content so much so I trust that these uh, resources will be very beneficial for you and for your children so make sure you go check it out uh, on mykc.ca or go to our YouTube channel now lastly, uh, I want to encourage you to keep on worshiping uh, with offering. You can do that online through the PayPal uh, method with your credit card, or you can also mail us a check. Um, you can find that address in our offering page and screen there uh, below. Now as we close out the worship service, I'm gonna send you out with the word of God. Today's benediction is from Ephesians chapter three. May the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ it grants you to be strengthened with power through His Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to Him who is able to, far, to, to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generation, forever and ever. Amen. We'll see you next week.
strength, my mind, I give you praise. With all my heart, my soul, I worship you. This life of mine will be an offering. My heart is set on your heavenly kingdom. My treasure is in heaven. My treasure is in you, Jesus. No earthly possessions. Could train my salvation Cause in Jesus my Lord I've been set free All your riches and glory Who awaits me in eternity Jesus, my Lord, I complete. Oh, I give you praise with all my strength, my mind. I give you praise. Oh, to Jesus, with all my heart, my soul. I worship you, only you. This time of my will be an offering. My heart is set on your heavenly kingdom. My treasure is in heaven. My treasure is in you, Jesus. Godliness with contentment is great gain, is great gain. I'll fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the life that you gave. Cause godliness with contentment is great gain. Is great gain with all my strength, my mind. I give you praise. Oh, we worship with all my heart, my soul. I worship you. My heart is set on your heavenly kingdom. My treasure is in heaven. My treasure is in you, Jesus. Oh, my treasure is in heaven. My treasure is in you, Jesus. your 
faithful and just to forgive us. Cleanse us from unrighteousness. By faith we are forgiven. As far as the ends of the world. So far has our sins been
God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee. Casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who was and is. Receive all the glory and honor and power, for you have made all things. Oh, worthy are you, God, our King and throne above. May you be praised, O oh, worthy. shall praise thy name in earth and skies and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons. Oh, blessed Trinity, oh, worthy are you, God, our Lord, God, and King. Receive all the glory and honor and power, for you have made all things. Worthy are you, God, our King and throne above. May you be praised, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, worthy are you, God. O oh, worthy are you, God. God, Lord, and King, receive all the glory and honor and power, for you have made all things. Oh, worthy are you, God, our King and throne above. May you be praised, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, worthy are you, God. May you be praised, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, O oh, worthy, 
worthy are you, God.